Hello and good evening, one and all. We are in the final session of this conference before the closing remarks. So thank you all for remaining with us. My name is Kim Lavi. I am from the INSS. And I am very happy to host, after all the heads of the parties we just saw, the next generation of political leaders. These are the guys who are going to determine what the next few decades in Israel will look like. Some of them are even now uh, in their own party's primary elections, so let's wish them luck. We had the heads of your parties over the last two days here, and we'd like to now hear your opinion about the issues at, at hand. Uh, okay, not all the party leaders were here. We didn't have the prime minister here, um, and we also didn't have the Beit Yehudi leader here. I'm sorry, if they don't speak into microphones, we will not be able to interpret what they say. Okay, so we have, the, we have, so we have Jonathan Dubov, he is the chairman of the Young Bait Yehudi, who is also a candidate in the primary elections. We have David Shian, who is the Young Likud. We have Yorai Lahav Herzano from Young Eish Atid. We have Tomer Pines from the Young Labour Party. And Bar Gisin, until a week ago, the chairman of Young Merits. There are democratic elections in Merits, so she's no longer the chairman. She was uh, replaced a week ago. So let me ask you to tell us briefly, in three minutes, what your vision is for the state of Israel in the context of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. What is the solution for the uh, conflict if you see one? And if possible, tell us what the difference is that you see as the young, in the, as the young generation versus what the older generation brings, meaning in the, uh, assuming that there is such a gap. So, Jonathan, let's begin with you. Okay, as for the conflict uh, of the last 100 years or even more, we can say that there is the land for peace, two-state solution. Me and my party don't believe in this formula because it has failed again and again. Two states for two nations we already have. There are two states, Palestine, and there's one in Jordan, there's one in Gaza, and we don't we don't need a Palestinian state, we only need one state, Israel. And if we can uh, offer a formula, a suggested formula to resolve the conflict, everyone is saying that the obstacle to peace is Israel. Well, no, you can see throughout history there are very clever people sitting in this room uh, who understand this area. The obstacle to peace has not been Israel, who agreed, unfortunately, to concede so many of its assets. The Palestinians' time and time again disagreed, did not accept. I think there is a very simple solution here. I know it may knock some people out of their chairs, but peace for peace. I am a religious person. I pray three times a day at least. Uh, I ask for peace from the heavens, and we all want peace. However, true peace comes in exchange for true peace, not for land. And if you want to drill down to the practical level, how it happens on the daily, uh, on daily level, so yes, we should annex sea areas to Israel, including the 100,000 Arab inhabitants who are currently living there. They should have equal rights. In A and B, there will be a civil autonomy with security control being in the hands of Israel from outside. They can have a parliament that will run their civil life. They can have a, a police force, of course, supervised by Israel with all the security around it being in the hands of Israel. And why? Because Israel has one opportunity. It's not going to get another chance or another opportunity to lose any war. We are living here by our sword, unfortunately. I don't think it's an ideal situation, but the solution is therefore not ideal either, but it is realistic. Guys, we have tried the Oslo Road. We have tried the two-state solution. It has really gone bankrupt. We need a new doctrine that that will deal with the reality on the ground. And the reality on the ground is that it's not an ideal situation right now. There are inhabitants there that need to be running their lives for themselves. We want to make sure that Israeli defense is in the hands of Israel, first and foremost, and the people of Israel are, first of all, I'm looking at my people, yes, I'm sorry, and I'm looking at what is threatening them. And when the Palestinians decide that they truly want 
to focus on rebuilding their lives rather than ruining the lives of others, then maybe we can talk about peace for peace as a formula and have true peace. And as for the young generation, right, you wanted, okay, very briefly, the young generation, by the way, that is the key because we are much more open. There are those who are fixated on all sorts of uh, formulas and the Facebook and the social media and the Arab Spring opens up people's heads and minds. So instead of the younger generation being educated to hate the Jews, maybe they should be educated to raise themselves properly, to rebuild themselves properly. Maybe we can be their friends. Maybe we can really have true peace for them, not for land, but for peace for peace. I don't know why Jonathan is the Jewish home. He can go to Likud after what he said. But if there is a solution, I think we tried a lot of ways to reach a solution, even before the establishment of the state. It was always the same style. And we came to a situation, we realized it's not going to work. It didn't work until now. And the, the question is, uh, if we can think about another possibility, I think the, uh, the people in Israel today, especially the young people, who don't uh, accept those uh, basic uh, assumptions. We used to assume that uh, as long as we don't uh, recede uh, and some of the uh, territories will never be able to live here in peace and life will be bad because we saw that at the end of the day it's true. Every few years uh, we have uh, like a military campaign. It's true that we have to cope with terror but all in all we live a good life here and we're not ready to give up our life or to give up our country as part of a gambling sort. What do you suggest? Another thing before that. We know, it's obvious, we all hear that in the next term, apparently President Trump is going to present his own peace plan. President Trump until now stood side by side with Israel and moving the embassy to Jerusalem was very significant and I think this is a great historical step. But now there's going to be a plan by Trump, and if in this plan, again, they will include uh, handing over territories from the state of Israel, I personally am going to be against it, and I think we as young people in our party, we're going to be against. I think uh, giving land from Israel again will jeopardize the security and future of Israel. So what do you suggest? What? Yes. And also, I think I want to do some pro for myself, I think the primaries that are going to take place in the Likud next week is very critical because we need in our party courageous people to face against uh, handing over parts of the state of Israel. What I do suggest, look, I don't believe uh, that there is a short term solution. There's no solution. What can we hope for? Maybe it'll happen in the future. Maybe our children will benefit. I have two kids myself. Maybe they will benefit. But in my vision, I see one state where we have Jews and Israeli Arabs within the state and the Palestinians are part of an autonomy. Maybe that uh, we are going to be sovereign over all the territories. And uh, you can tell me, what are you talking about? People are not going to agree to that. Okay, but this is my vision. I can tell you, if you talk to me about two states, I'll tell you where are you living. What are you dreaming of? This is my vision. That's where I am going, and we can do many, many steps to uh, cancel the civil administration in Judea, Samaria, to stop the incitement within the PA and in the uh, school curriculum and the mosques and other steps we can take so that maybe in the future we'll come to some sort of a solution. If you can focus, please. Good evening. Thank you for inviting me. Look, 
העמדות של שני החברים שלפניי, הן מאוד 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 מ
אני אמשיך, הליכוד, ממש להפריע, זה ממש חלק מהטקטיקה. Yes, I think it's part of your taxes, taxes to interfere. חברים, אני מאמין בהיפרדות מוחלטת בינינו לבין הפלסטינים, כל אופציה אחרת תגרור אותנו או לאפרטהייד, או למדינה שהיא חסרת רוב יהודי, שני הדברים הם לא מקובלים. אני חושב שאני 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 חושב חבר'ה, מה שקורה, אני רוצה לקדם פה שני רעיונות. Guys, what is happening? I want to promote two ideas that I think that the Israeli left should promote. The trend at the moment that the settlements drag the government in our economy, where all our law enforcement, our whole life is bending. Under the settlements, it's dragged in order to maintain this enterprise, and I believe that the people of Israel do not believe in the greater Israel. I think that if the people of Israel would, in fact, support any settlement, it would be different. But it doesn't happen. What the right did wonderfully in the last five years, and that's the failure of the left, is the unified thinking that the. There is a connection between military presence in the West Bank and the civil settlement. And that's why is this mistake that the settlements actually protect Israelis and promote security. But the truth is um, exactly the opposite. The truth is on the contrary, uh, right? Uh, big consensus of the security forces, wherever it only makes it difficult. It, and, and it increases the line of protection. There's always friction with the civil society. It does not contribute anything to the settlements. Had it worked, by the way, uh, that uh, the citizens are protecting us, maybe in the Lebanon war, we would take our citizens into the line of enemy. But But in any war, we always retreat, we always withdraw, because anybody understands that the one who protects uh, security is the army, not the civilians. Now, the question is whether our presence in the settlement is worth the price, and that's a legitimate dispute. But we have to say uh, fairly, this is the price. The price. This is the security price for your will to sit in all of greater Israel. And the second thing, is our perceptions as people who believe that we have to promote the two-state solution, we have to deal with the development of policy. The policy is quite obvious, where to divide, uh, how to separate. There are endless plans of how to do the two states. Mr. Barlev, Mr. Peres, what we need is to promote the public opinion towards these solutions and to create the atmosphere and the public pressure that will push the government to promote this solution. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here in the week following my decision to be replaced, but I'm very happy to be here. I think that perhaps the most interesting thing that we can see in this panel, and I'm very happy in this instance to be the last to speak, is the very natural progression and very logical progression of the positions by Meret, who have had the same position quite stably for Uh, many years, uh, two states, ending the occupation, dividing Jerusalem, and so on and so forth. And then you see it there too. Jonathan will get to you in a moment. You see how the pro progress that we, of this uh, view that was once perceived as very extreme becoming a mainstream that everyone in their political conjecture calls it something else. But even Jonathan didn't know how to address this craziness of occupation when it came to A and B. So he said, peace for peace, but on the other hand, there'll still be something there. What will I call it? We'll call it an autonomy. We'll protect it. We'll defend it. No one is uh, ignoring the fact anymore if uh, years ago that people did ignore the fact that there are Palestinians, that we need to set up the authority, that we need two states, something that Merit has said again and again. And here, this issue comes back up and is now becoming the mainstream and the understanding that the only way to create a future here, and now we're getting to the younger generation, 
to create a future here for me and for these guys and for our children is through two states. A two-state solution for two peoples who will be sitting and wo living alongside one another, but separately, with full autonomy and full rights that each state provides to its people without any military control in the clearest way possible. There is no other way. You cannot avoid it. Call it what you will. An autonomy, an arrangement, a conflict. Each of the people here on this stage, and I'm very happy about what Tomer said, by the way. I think that is a really refreshing voice in the Labour Party because most of the members of Knesset and, spe and spokespeople of the party don't say that because you forgot about Eitan Kabel's initiative and others. I completely agree. So congratulations and I hope you get very far in the primary elections. And yet, when you understand that this is the move that the entire political system in Israel is doing toward the realization that the only way to end the occupation is not a hundred year conflict, it's not, it's an occupation, Israeli military occupation over another people, a Palestinian people, is a two state solution. Then we will be able to resolve it and to have true peace. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. You're wonderful. I saw that you were squirming in your seats, the two of you, while the center and left were talking. And I wanted to give you the opportunity to respond in your eye afterwards. We can also ask whether you're center or left. Well, it depends on which day he's here. I want to really ask you a more difficult question following what's been said here. You want to annex sea areas. And obviously you know that what this will lead to is international ice. You probably realize that you don't think the Palestinians will be accepting uh, having Israel, Israel control what they see as 60% of their land and they're not going to go down quietly. And so you are actually condemning your children and my children to a life of continuous war, a life of isolation, a life that is very difficult economically, socially and in civil aspects. We are going to have a country, most of, we, most of the resources of which will be allocated to protecting these areas. What would you suggest for the younger generation? Is this the future you see? At the end of the day, there will be a hundred or more Palestinian enclaves that will have continuous terrorism coming out of it. What do you suggest? That we live by our sword? We'll continue to do that? Let's look reality in the eye. Like Barr said, they're not going to disappear. And that's true. On the other hand, we too are not going to disappear. With all due respect to live by our sword and everything else you have mentioned before, that is our reality. We cannot uh, ignore it. And uh, people cannot be occupiers in their own land. And the last time I checked in our Bible, this is my belief, this is our country. We cannot occupy our own country. That's where we start, that's where we'll develop from. And now we are in a situation where if you want to raise your children here peacefully, quietly and with love, I'm not sure you want Ben Gurion Airport to have, I mean, David lives in Leshem. Go to his house, see that how a small RPG can reach Ben Gurion Airport, Tel Aviv, Petach Tikva. Do you want to raise your children in such a reality? Yes, the settlements and these settlers are protecting everyone's lives. Because wherever the plow is, that's where the border is. It's a lose-lose situation. It's a some zero game. Your solutions are 100 years old. There are many experienced security professionals here. And we know that the Palestinians don't usually abide by Western regime ways. And the fact that many of you have not set foot in Nablus for many years, and why? Because they have a certain construction there, a certain structure. And I'm thinking of my people first. First of all, what will be good for the Jewish people? You talked before about two states and you're very happy that everyone is taking your direction. No, there are already two states for one group of population that calls themselves a people. And that's Jordan, where more than 50% of the population define themselves as Palestinians. And in Gaza, where unfortunately, after Gush Katif was evacuated, we, ha went, we left there. There are two million Palestinians there. If somebody wants to live here and to be self have self-determination here as Palestinian, go to Jordan, go to Gaza, 
Gaza. There's also a new plan to go to go to, to Sinai. That's fine with me. So you are saying, well, let's move from two states to one state and military occupation. That's what you're talking about. No, not military occupation. If you want to live here, well, you'll have to understand that just as we understand that they're here, they also need to understand that we're going to stay. And with all due respect, first and foremost, I connect to what your eye is saying. First of all, my people and then others. Because you were asked about annexation, you asked about annexation and how the international arena will consider this. I don't want to annex for myself, for the Jewish people, because it's impossible that the Jewish people, the state of Israel, there will be citizens who can vote for the Knesset and those who can't. If there'll be an, th there is a lack of annexation because of the Jewish people, because of the justice of the Jewish people, that's one thing about annexation. As for that's about the right, and as for the left, that wants to get out of the territories, and there will be doves flying out in the air, and flowers will bloom. We in 2005 left the Gaza Strip completely and wholly. We left 3,000 uh, uh, agricultural fields. And what did they do? They set them on fire. That's so superficial. Wait, when they uh, when they set this, uh, these fields ablaze, that is superficial. I'm not done. And when the current the Netanyahu government doesn't respond to 500 missiles being launched just a few months ago directed at Israel when Miri Tamno, the mother of three, barely managed to move her children into a shelter and save their lives. That's not superficial. Excuse me. That's why we need super, we need separation. David, a sentence. Tomer, a sentence. Okay. I can maybe argue with Bar and Tomer because Bar and Tomer, okay, they have their position, they have their view, and they're living here in Sheikh Munis, they're sitting here in Sheikh Munis, which is already also a settlement. But we saw what happened when we gave up territories. Uh, let's set that aside. But you're talking about young people. Young people are not willing to accept lies. Your lie. You are selling people lies. You cannot talk about dividing Jerusalem. I'm not talking about dividing you, Jerusalem. Okay, this is fake news. I'm sorry. I, I mean, you're talking about reaching peace without dividing Jerusalem. And that is a lie. That is a pipe dream. You put putting words in my mouth. You are talking about Ariel as a settlement block. Have you ever gone to Ariel? Ariel is going to be an enclave. Is that what you want? You want us to have an enclave of 20,000 people who are living somewhere? Everybody understands it's impossible. I am in favor of the blocks remaining. Stop selling lies. This is a lie. It cannot happen. I agree with David. The Jewish people will have to choose between two alternatives. Are we going to continue with the settlements who are holding holding our country by the throat, or if we're going to have a lateral government who will, and we'll have to give up on some of our land. And perhaps that is the difference between me and Bar and Merit. First of all, when we did this engagement, we have had less people die in the last 15 years than we did in five years there. But we could have evacuated the settlements, we could have remained with military presence, we could have left security in every place where you are, we could have had a military base. Before the disengagement, I'm sorry, they're all speaking at the same time. Jonathan, you cannot address Gaza because you have come out of there militarily. If you had left military presence there, I'm not talking about a peace agreement, I'm talking about defense. Until then, was there a peace? It's all pipe dreams. Okay, please don't disrupt one another. I just want to say one general sentence. And I said the same yesterday on a panel in Ynet. Guys, 70 years since the, the Jewish people have returned from exile and have set up a technological and military and economic superpower. Stop thinking like ghetto people, that if we move one centimeter away, an RPG will come and destroy us. We're strong, we're here, and we're not going anywhere. Enough is enough. Okay, a question from the audience, please. I'm sorry, I can't interpret the question. Perhaps if the speakers could repeat the question, because I cannot hear it. First of all, we'd like to congratulate you for being here. Since you are the future leadership, 
and you will be at the crossroads making decisions in five, ten years' time, doesn't matter how long. Let us come out of this disagreement about or, or this argument about the conflict. Let each of you please describe the state of Israel and what it would look like in ten years' time. In all aspects, in ten years, forget it. In any in any respect, in any aspect. Okay, let me begin this time. In two sentences. <coughs> Meret and I have three very significant pillars that go hand in hand. And they are very simple. Three distributions. The distribution of the land, the, dis the, uh, the separating the uh, religion from the state and reallocating capital. Uh, in a few years' time, I'm working very hard to create a social democratic, Jewish democratic country where religion is separated from the state and that exists alongside a Palestinian state. Anything else along the way, any other decision uh, not uh, having one of these pillars will be a concession and we will be giving up on the exemplary state that Herzl wanted us to build here and all the values that have brought Zionism as it was established. It will simply make this country redundant and the exemplary state we're supposed to have here redundant. I will be brief because I think that my dreams and Bar's dreams at least are quite similar about the future of the state. I imagine a liberal regime with a strong uh, lawful uh, rule of law uh, allowing the Arabs to also feel part of this country and that we're not occupiers, not in our land and not in any other land. I'll be happy to visit there in Samaria with a passport at this point and certainly a welfare state that takes more from the rich and gives more social advanced services to its population. A Jewish and democratic state with a developed economy that constantly looks towards the next 10 years in all aspects of life is such a shame that both in the political sense and in other areas uh, I'm, without a doubt, no one in the current government is waking up to work and saying what's going to happen in transportation in five years' time, what's going to happen here in five years' time in education or in high tech. These days, we are in a startup nation because 20 years ago they invested in it so that there'll be a high tech, a thriving high tech industry here. The next high tech industry is in Ireland, far from Israel. We need to invest in high tech, in innovation, in technology. We need to make sure that young couples in Israel can make ends meet each month and that the elderly are treated with respect that the um, emergency rooms in Israel will not be 200 percent in terms of their capacity that the longevity and the life expectancy in the in the periphery will not be three and a half years shorter than it is in the center of in central Israel, that we are advanced in all areas and that the justice system is working for us and not for the politicians around. The state that I would like to live in in 10 years' time and I would like my children to live in in 10 years' time is a country with a strong economy that is liberal, that has trade agreements, a state that has a peace agreement with the countries around it, a peace agreement with Iran. I'd like to see a country where the values of Judaism are embedded in society that people feel connected to it rather than a country where if you talk about Judaism you're constantly being attacked for religionization. I'd like to see a state where there are 12 million Jews living here, that every Jew in the world will feel at home here, will feel that they are part of this. I'd like to see a country that has a strong iron curtain that's very strong because that'll be the only thing that will safe keep us here and make us live a good life here. I'm sorry, I cannot hear the question from the audience. Yes, with the laws together, please don't be pessimistic, sir. I see here a Jewish state, as the prophets have said, and democratic, as the scroll of independence says. And it doesn't mean it has to go collide with one another, democratic and Jewish. We need to maximize the welfare of the individual, but also ensure that community and society are taken care of. 
You're talking about the LGBTs as well. Jonathan, anyone living in Israel? Yes, also the LGBTs. So, so yes, you'll get rights, but not recognition. But this is not the, the, the issue of this panel. I see, on the one hand, the Jewish people living here in Israel feeling connected to this country, feeling that it's okay to be Jewish, to be religious in Israel, together with being a secular Jew, a state that is strong security-wise, economically, and mostly socially. I think that if we, and remember, if you are strong, you make peace. And if we accept that, we'll be able to continue standing up for our resilience, we'll keep standing up for our values, and everyone around us will finally understand that we're all for thriving and prosperity and not for war. But as long as we have to keep doing with this war, we're going to keep continuing to be victorious. Thank you very much. No, don't worry. I have immigrated to Israel from a communist country. I want to leave communism there. I want to ask you a question. We talked about the political issue. You each have a very clear view of what needs to be done. But it seems like, except for Abayt Yehudi, your parties are not really putting this issue as a flagship sort of thing in your platforms, in the, the elections. The Likud still doesn't have a platform, if I understand correctly. We only just started this election campaign. You didn't have one in the pre previous election campaign either. You don't know what your parties are planning. Is the political, is the peace process no longer an issue? Is the public not interested anymore? Is it something that perhaps, unlike what we say, we don't go to elections over? Well, the public is, has tired of the leftist uh, solutions, and the Baita Yehudi will decide. The question is, how can the public be uh, tired of leftist solutions when we've had a uh, right-wing government for 15 years? Well, we tried Oslo. It didn't work. I think that the public is not stupid, and the public understands that a peace process is, uh, and negotiations over it is important. It's important to talk about it in order to live in a sane country in peace and uh, prosperity, but it's not the only thing. And when the public is interested in voting in the ballot box, they want to get fuller answers, and therefore the peace process uh, uh, has to go hand in hand with the socio-economic and with the religion and state uh, issue. And I know the whole talk about merits being a party of people who like legalization, public transportation, and uh, recycling, but at the end of the day, in Maris, there is not, le there is no less security orientation or uh, um, political knowledge than any other the, than any other party. The only difference is that we're also realistic, and within this realism, we know that we should acknowledge and recognize reality and facts, see people, see the public, and first of all, try to understand how we can serve the Israeli public in the best way possible, in the worthiest, most appropriate way, and also the fairest way. I think that is something that we are missing in Israeli culture and in Israeli politics, and that is fairness. And when we look at citizens and look for fairness towards the political aspects, the social aspects, the economic aspects, and so on and so forth. We can simply offer a concrete solution. We can talk about the clearest discourse from this panel without saying, yes, maybe autonomy, all sorts of words that don't mean anything and nobody understands, and then maybe you vote for them once, and then they disappear in the next elections. Merits still does not wave that banner as it used to. And I want to ask David, why does the Prime Minister not show us his his peace plan? What is he talking about? What is he thinking about? Well, actions speak louder than words, and they're more important, as we see. And I think that the discourse about the peace process has, was always there. 
I think it's just changed a little bit. I mean, people are no longer living in pipe dreams about the solution that's going to happen tomorrow morning, and they're no longer dreaming about an agreement that cannot actually take place tomorrow. People are talking differently now. And I think that we in this event, when we're sitting here at the INSS, I think that the people sitting in this room, I mean, we all want peace, that's clear. But again, we're talking about realism. But realism is not going into a lab and making experiments that's not gonna work, that are not gonna work and hoping it's gonna work this time, but saying what realism says it's gonna work. That's completely the opposite of realism. You're thinking anti-realistically. And therefore, I would expect the people sitting in this room to try and think, perhaps, and develop, perhaps, another kind of thinking. I truly hope that there will be people, that there are people here at the INSS who are trying to think of a different solution as well, that is not two states. To think of something else, something, uh, some kind of solution that will come at a different time in a different way. But we have many tools and instruments that we can use in order to promote this, so that our children will not have to fight. Okay, we have very little time, two minutes, Tormer and Yorai. I do want to admit uh, our faults. I admit that the matter of um, the political aspect is not actually uh, talked about enough. That's the problem with Israel in the last hundred years. I think the last two decades this discourse is not prominent enough in public discourse. And it's not because what my friends from the right wing want to say because there is nothing to do with because the leadership on the left side of the map have lost their vision, have lost their way, have lost their ability to dream up in a, a new world. And it, they have lost the ability to lead this discourse. And in the absence of a left side of the map and a left side of the argument in any um, the security based uh, crisis, what we see are two views. And the two views are between Netanyahu and Bennett. When there's no left side of the map of the conversation of the vision, that is what's, uh, well, that's why it's wilting. Uh, slowly but surely, and that is what we as the younger generation of the left should be doing, to take back this vision, to put it back on the map. I want to repeat what I said at the beginning. I have no idea what the Israeli government's policy is vis-a-vis -vis the security political situation, just like I don't know what they think about uh, health or what they think about drafting the ultra-Orthodox into the army, because when the prime minister passed the law about the army, because he said Yair Lapid told him to, and then he uh, annulled it because he said uh, Litzman told him to. The problem is with our political system that works mostly for the politicians and their people and not for the Israeli public. We want to expand the political system so that the peace process can also be on the table. We want to um, put together the next government and lead Israel so that we can at least implement the plan we put on the table alongside other plans. Well, friends, thank you so much for being here tonight and good luck to you in the primary elections and the elections in general.